What's up guys? Sean Mishka from Explosive Edge Athletics in Edina, Minnesota. Coming in regards to our jump tip video series and coming with the sixth installment of that video tip series. Hopefully you haven't missed the other ones. If you have, go ahead and go check those out. Uh, today we're going to be talking about an all-important topic in regards to jump performance, and that's the one of increasing or assessing rate of force development. We know on the surface, and really when we start to break it down as well, that all jump-specific tasks require a high rate of force development. Okay, case in point, for example, uh, in a counter movement jump, the amount of time that we have to develop force in our concentric action or in our push-off phase, meaning from the bottom of our counter movement to the time that our toe leaves the ground, is going to be very limited. We're going to have anywhere from 200 to 400 milliseconds to develop force. So 0.2 to 0.4 seconds. Not a whole heck of a lot of time. Uh, again, that time is going to be very diverse or variable uh, based on the types of strength requirements or power qualities that your body possesses and the type of jumper you are. Uh, so that's why one of the earlier videos talked about finding that specific angles to make sure that we're taking advantage of that. Uh, if we start to make movements more dynamic, meaning if we have a running vertical jump, uh, an approach type jump, a one-legged jump, usually those jumps are going to have shorter ground contact times. They could be much shorter than that two to four hundred milliseconds. Okay, and in an optimal world, we actually would want them to be shorter, so we have less escape of elastic energy. But on the flip side of this is that max force production takes about six to eight hundred milliseconds to develop. So 0.6 to 0.8 seconds. Okay, a whole heck of a lot more time than we usually have in jump-specific tasks. For this reason, that's why heavy strength training, such as squatting more, really only has great impact in correlation to higher jump heights with individuals who are at low levels of sports mastery, uh, or if they have average or below average strength levels. Uh, so usually those individuals are people who have only been training for, say, 6 to 12 months, uh, or simply haven't been able to really focus in on exactly what makes their, their jump weak or strong. Uh, now, the flip side of this, however, is this one little catch, is that strength and power jumpers usually are going to be on the longer end of that duration. Okay, if we were to look at time to takeoff, however, uh, many studies have now proven that if we decrease time to takeoff, meaning now the time to takeoff is a little different than that concentric phase duration uh, or that push-off phase duration, but time to takeoff is going to be starting from the actual counter movement to the time that our body takes off. Okay, but what research has shown us is that time to take off has a direct correlation to the jump height that we're going to get. Why? Well, because we know that in, at a base level again, as I've said in a number of videos already, is that in order to jump higher, we need to increase the vertical velocity of our center of mass, or essentially our body, at the moment that the toe has taken off. Okay, uh, so we know that in pretty much the majority of jumping athletes, we need to increase rate of force development, we need to increase our time to peak force, uh, or I should say, we need to increase uh, our rate of that time to peak force. Okay? Uh, so if we look at a force time curve, we know that strength power jumpers usually will develop more force, so if we look at a, an actual curve, I'm just going to draw one in thin air here for you. If we have this axis and this axis will be representative of force, and we have a time axis down here, again looking at this graph, a strength power jumper is going to put out more force, but it might take he or she longer to get to that force. If we can increase our rate of force development, so we increase force but decrease time, we're going to make that jumper better. Now how can we usually assess if this is a weakness for that athlete or not? Well, at a base level, if you don't have a lot of fun, fancy toys like as a force plate or something like a myo test, even though something like this myo test, which is a accelerometer, isn't very expensive, it's, it's actually very cost effective, which is going to be something that's going to hook up to your belt. Uh, we have an actual belt that this hooks up to, and it will be gathering time as you were to do your jump specific task. Uh, this will give us a force time curve, as would a force plate. Unfortunately, most people don't have those types of resources to be able to call upon to see where their actual specific force development is at. Uh, but the majority of jump specific athletes need to be doing cycles and periodized cycles of rate of force development, specific rate of force development work. How can we do that? Well, there's a couple different ways. The first one is to simply have greater intention during your actual jump specific movements, meaning that you're trying to jump faster. As I mentioned in an earlier jump video, uh, slow jumping is low jumping in most cases. 
So we need to increase the velocity that we're going to attain, especially that speed in the beginning part of the motion. So what I actually try to do is, even though a pause or static jump is somewhat a, a, a different type of exclusive object than, or task than that of a counter movement jump, we can break it down into a little different fashion. We can start to jump from a pause style. So we might hold here for anywhere from two to five seconds and then immediately jump as high as we can. And if we start to do that, we need to focus on the way that that force is being developed rather than the height that we're attaining. Okay, typically people just try to focus on jumping high, but they don't necessarily concern themselves with how the force is being developed in that actual uh, jump or push-off phase. So what I try to do here is I teach athletes or a good coaching cue is at this bottom position of this counter movement, whether we're doing a counter movement jump or a pause jump technique style, we want to focus on pushing the ground down, so essentially pulling into the ground, and that will help us attain greater velocity earlier in that duration or earlier in that time, uh, especially when we look at the way that force is developed from a proximal to distal fashion in every jump style. Okay. Once we get that proficient, uh, once we get that movement proficient, I should say, then we can start to add loads to that. Uh, loaded jump squatting, yeah, loaded jumps are essentially are going to be our quickest, most possible way to increase that rate of force development, especially from what research has shown. There's not a lot better movements, there's not many better movements, I should say, than loaded jump squatting. We can do that through the use of a jump squat with a bar on our back. We can do it uh, maybe having a weighted uh, belt on or a weighted vest like so. Okay. Now we don't necessarily need to uh, have a lot of load here. With speed, strength oriented type movements, we don't want to get above about 40% of our typical squat one rep max. So if we're doing a loaded jump squat here, we won't go above 40% of a squat one rep max. So we're going to keep reps uh, very low and rest periods very high. Uh, with the loaded jumping from a vest standpoint or belt or something of the like, we're going to keep that load again about 10 to maybe only upward to about 15%. The reason is, is we don't want to change the force velocity characteristics to the point where our body gets more acclimated to overcoming a tremendous amount of loads. We want to still keep speeds fairly high so we continue to keep the technique and coordination where it needs to be so when we do an unloaded jump, that movement or that training exercise that we utilize will have some carryover and have a direct transfer to the movement, skill, and coordination that we need to have in the movement that we're trying to improve. Hopefully that makes some sense. Some other ways that we can do it, uh, beyond jump squatting with say a bar on our back or a vest or dumbbells in our hand or what have you, and doing an actual explosive ballistic style of jump, we can move, use things such as Olympic lifts. So, uh, Olympic lifts are going to really focus in on that triple extension type power. Uh, so triple extension being at the hip, knee, and ankle. We're trying to get those to develop force from a proximal again to distal fashion, meaning that we're going to develop force here that then will be transferred down into the knee joint and transferred down then into the ankle joint and through into the ground in order to propel ourselves upward. And so when we look at Olympic lifts, they can be terrific for this. Uh, we want to use things such as hand cleans or power cleans. Uh, we can do things such as snatches or even clean and jerks. Anything like that is going to have transfer. And that's why you often see Olympic lifters who can jump fairly high heights. If, if anybody's heard that, uh, that definitely has some truth to it. Uh, even if they don't necessarily possess a jumping skill and coordination in that specific movement capacity, they have the strength and power characteristics to be able to develop force in the same fashion that we want our jumping athletes to possess. Another way that we can do it is through the use of accommodated resistance, such as in a squat movement and the thing I'm going to show you how to set up here in a bit. So accommodated resistance is going to be through the use of bands or chains. Now a band, again, we, we addressed the bands on a number of times already in the videos. I have a setup where I have pegs in my squat rack, so some of you might not be as fortunate uh, to have that quick, easy setup. We need to be able to change bands in and out very easily in our facility for the high volume of athletes that we work with. So if you don't have pegs in your squat rack, don't worry about that. You can hook it up to a dumbbell or a kettlebell or something like that that's going to keep this band down attached at the bottom and have a sufficient amount of stretch. We also have dumbbells on the rack to make sure that with some of our athletes who are a little more explosive that that rack doesn't begin to move. Now you can just hook the band up like so. Uh, however, you want to get this band as close as possible uh, to the center of that bar 
The reason why I have it out here is so you can actually see how it's kind of hooked up at the moment because that'll be key to the concept. You do the bands, or you can also do the chain. Now there's a number of different chain setups out there. Again, I'm hooking the chain to the point we have an easy clip system. Okay, not everybody has that. There's going to be a lot of different styles out there. Again, I would typically usually put this as close to the bar as I can, but I'm going to pull it out here so you can kind of get the concept again, just like you did with the bands. Uh, now, with the use of a comedy resistance, the reason why it works so well is that when we have it attached to the bar like this, when someone is in the bottom of their squat, so they're at their deepest knee flexion, deepest counter movement depth, the one that's going to correspond to their jump stop, they're going to have the least amount of resistance. Notice as one would lower with each one of these steps, less and less resistance will be on the bar and on our back, of course. So as we then go up, we're allowed to accelerate. We have to accelerate, otherwise the bar will come back down because the resistance is becoming greater. However, with either one of these methods, when we are down in that bottom position, we have less resistance to overcome. So it allows us to give a greater peak and move with greater velocity so we have a better degree of rate of force development uh, work that we're using specifically with this type of task. Now I know that some of these concepts, we're going to hopefully continue to piece them all together here for you. Hopefully some of these are making sense. If not, please feel free to ask questions down at the bottom of the comment section. We're going to continue to try to pull the pieces together here for you of this puzzle. Uh, it's a very complicated puzzle, not as easy as people will make it out to be. But when we look at rate of force development, we know we want to maximize force, we need to minimize time, because that's an inherent, important objective with all jump styles out there. For Sean Mishka, Explosive Edge Athletics and he died in Minnesota, that's been Jump Tip video uh, number six, and we'll see you again in number seven. Thanks, guys.